independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, hello, my true crime army, and welcome to Military Murder, your true crime podcast. I am your host, Margot, and I created this podcast for true crime enthusiasts just like you. But I wanted to focus on a subsection of society, right? I didn't want to focus on all crimes committed by anyone on planet Earth. And I chose to focus on the military, and I'll tell you why. I listen to my fair share of true crime podcasts, and I watch investigation discovery like my life depends on it. And I am more intrigued by crimes committed by military members or upon military members because these are members of our society that give so much of themselves in serving our country. But when these veterans commit crimes or even worse, when crimes are committed upon our veterans, you just tend to feel all types of different ways on the inside. And that right there, that feeling, that is why I chose to focus on the military. I was chatting with someone and they asked me if I had heard about a soldier on soldier decapitation that occurred on a military installation. And I was like, dude, you are yanking my chain. But I was curious. I was like, is this real? And so I go to Google and I find myself in this web and this story. And so I kept digging and digging and digging. And that's the story that I'm bringing to you today. Today, I bring to you a story that unravels a military love triangle that literally caused someone to lose their head. Today, I discuss the case against Army Sergeant Stephen Schapp. Now, let's dig in. I want to start with a list of my sources because I'm not an investigator or a reporter or an investigative reporter. So I rely on publicly available information to bring the cases I discuss on this podcast. First, shout out to the Army for following the Freedom of Information Act rules and providing me with a copy of two things, the redacted investigative report and also the action. And these two things corroborated the information I already had through reporting by Mark Kincaid and Craig Martin from the European Stars and Stripes as well as Steve Vogel's reporting from the Washington Post. And I also relied heavily on the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces Court Opinion. Our story begins with a young fellow named Steve. Steve was the oldest of six kids, and he was very smart. He participated in gifted and talented programs, and he was named Student of the Year his senior year of high school. He wasn't a problem child at all. In fact, he was a kid you might want as your own. Like 50% of other families, when he was 14 years old, his parents divorced, and this really affected Steve. He decides in his head that when he decides to get married, that marriage, it's going to be forever. It's not, there's going to be nothing that's going to be able to separate that. And so when I was, when I was researching this, I thought, oh man, this is so sweet. But you just wait because sometimes sweet love can turn into crazy murder. So Steve goes on to go to college and his senior year of college, he meets the girl, the girl of his dreams, the girl that gives you like that extra sparkle in your eye. He meets her. Her name was Diane and they date for about six months and then they get married. The first year of marriage could have been great. However, they wanted to start a family and they experienced three very rough miscarriages. After that, Diane was done. She said, I am done. I don't want to have kids anymore. Steve was devastated. You see, he always wanted a family. His perfect plan was to have two biological kids and then to adopt two more after that. But he loved Diane too much. He didn't want to see her in pain. And at the age of 23, he decided he was going to get a vasectomy and he went through with it. What Steve could have never known was that at this point in his young marriage, there were cracks beginning to show. He just didn't know they were there. 
He originally starts working for the family business, but after he's married, he decides that he's going to join the military. And in the fall of 91, he joins the army as a private. And then he goes to basic training. Then in 1992, he he learns that he's going to go to his first duty station, which is in Sickles Army Air Base in Fulda, Germany. So that's pretty cool, right? He's just this young guy and he gets to travel the world. So he's off to Germany. I found this odd that Steve thinks naively that by joining the military, he's going to be able to spend more time with his wife. What he doesn't realize is that military life is hard and it sucks. And sometimes you have to spend a lot of time away from your family instead of together with them. And so Diane, she's also kind of having these issues where she's not sure that she even loves this guy anymore. But, you know, she she looks at her options and she says, you know, I could go to Germany. We could make it work. And... And, you know, I'm, I'm going to give this a shot. And so that's exactly what she does. So while the young couple is in Germany, they're off making friends. And like any community, and especially in the military, and especially when you're overseas, the people that you're going to be making friends with, they're the people that you work with and the people that live close to you. You know, the close, the people who are in close proximity to you. And when you're overseas, the military and your neighbors, they become your family because your family are thousands of miles away. And that's exactly what happens in March of 1993, when Steve becomes friends with specialist Gregory Glover during air assault school. So Greg, Steve and Diane, they become the best, basically the best of friends are doing everything mostly together. And Greg is a single guy, but he hangs out with Steve and Diane all the time. And this isn't uncommon in military communities for a couple to kind of take on a single friend just because, you know, the military, like I said, we're, they're all family. And Greg is, you know, Greg is having dinner over there. He's going over there listening to music. They're just having a grand old time. And Greg even helps to plan Thanksgiving dinner with Steve, Diane and another couple. In addition to making friends, Diane realizes that she doesn't just want to be home sitting by herself all day. And so she takes a volunteer position at the base legal office. In the fall of 93, Steve is now a sergeant in the army. And he's picked up for a four week military training back in the States. And so Diane stays behind because she has this volunteer position. So she stays in Germany while Steve goes and does this four weeks. And they can continue to communicate over snail mail and everything seems to be going great, at least in Steve's eyes. And then he returns and he has no idea that his marriage is falling apart. But on Thanksgiving Day, Diane, she tells Steve, listen, our marriage isn't working out anymore. I I want a divorce. And so Steve is shocked. He's like, wait a minute, what? I first didn't even know that our marriage was falling apart, but to go straight from our marriage is falling apart to divorce, I mean, can we work on it? And he's already determined in his head, no, I am never getting a divorce. So this isn't going to happen. He basically just kind of shuts her out. By early December, Diane is thinking, hey, I'm really cooped up in this house. I need to get away. I need a girl's trip. And Steve says, cool, go ahead, take your girl's trip. He's probably thinking maybe she needs to decompress. Maybe she needs time to think about it. So off she goes. But while she's away, he starts snooping around his wife's things. And he's thinking, you know, my wife hasn't been acting right. So I, I'm going to see if there's something I can find. Maybe there is something. And while he's snooping, he finds her diary. And I know you're probably thinking, okay, cool. He finds her diary. There's no way that she's crazy enough to be putting anything in there. So if she's having an affair or if she has something crazy going on, she's not going to write it in her diary. Clearly, I mean, she didn't hide it well enough because her husband found it. And if you thought this, you would be wrong because I don't know what she wrote in there. And I haven't been able to find the diary. And in fact, I think that he ends up destroying the diary at some point. But what she wrote in there was sufficient evidence for him to quickly confront his wife upon her return from her girl's trip. Diane is beyond herself. She's like, wait a minute. No, I would never cheat on you. How dare you accuse me of this? I have not cheated on you. I promise. In fact, I everything that I wrote in that diary, that's all a fantasy. That is all just fantasies of things that I envision myself doing, like like daydreaming. But everything in there is fake. I haven't cheated on you, I promise. And for whatever reason, Steve takes his wife's word for it and he seems to just kind of let it go. The following day, they meet with a counselor and Steve at this point decides he's going to grant his wife a divorce. And then Diane starts making plans to return back to the United States. 
As I was thinking about this, I think that maybe after Steve found this diary and his wife tells him that she's fantasizing about, apparently she's fantasizing about other men. But by this point, he's thinking, you know, it's probably worse for me to keep my wife hostage in a marriage that she doesn't want to be in than actually to just give her a dang divorce. December 7th was a typical day, but what Steve and Diane didn't know was that by the end of the day, someone would be dead and one of them would be the main suspect. Steve wakes up and he puts on his uniform. He's getting ready for work and off to work he goes. Typical routine. Diane wakes up and this morning she has plans to go to the bank, but she isn't feeling very well, so she goes to the hospital. While she's at the hospital, she calls one of her coworkers at the base legal office And she asks that person to give someone a message, someone who isn't her husband. And the coworker is confused, like, wait, what? You want me to tell so-and-so that you're in the hospital? But, I mean, what should I tell your husband? Do you want me to tell him? Yeah, yeah, sure. And then the call ends. The coworker wasn't quite sure what to make of the situation, but he was like, you know what? I'm just the messenger and that's it. Later that afternoon, Steve gets the message and off to the hospital he goes because he's super worried. He thinks that his wife is at the hospital because she has been having issues with ovarian cysts. So he gets to the hospital around 2.20. And when he gets to the hospital, Diane doesn't look so well. She's like pale and she just doesn't look very good. In fact, she looks like she has a lot on her mind. And so Steve is thinking the worst, like, oh, my God, is she dying of cancer? Is something wrong with her? Like, what's going on? Diane then tells him that she has a confession. And Steve is even more confused, like, what kind of confession could my wife have to make at a hospital? And Diane quickly says, I'm pregnant. And Steve is confused, like, wait, this story is just so freaking confusing. I had a vasectomy, so how could she be pregnant? I'd like to welcome our newest sponsor, Ritual. Vitamins, do you take them? Well, just like that deadbeat you married straight out of tech school, vitamin labels can be disappointing. The labels claim one thing, but the fine print is like, just kidding, these vitamins don't really do that hard pass. Enter Ritual, made for skeptics by skeptics. With their multivitamin for women, what you see is what you get, and what you get is good. I've always been into taking vitamins, especially a multivitamin. But I hate the awful taste or smell or aftertaste that many multivitamins give off. Well, with Ritual, this is a non-issue. I just finished up my first bottle of Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin. And the first thing, the very first thing I noticed when I first started using it was its minty taste. This is by far the best tasting vitamin I have taken in my life. And I've been taking multivitamins on a daily basis since I was in my mid-20s. But it's not just about the taste, it's about what you're putting into your body. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is one of the few women's multis that's USP verified, meaning what's on the label is what's in the formula. It's also soy-free, gluten-free, vegan-friendly, and formulated without GMOs. And with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, including magnesium, vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin D3, just to name a few, you know exactly what you're putting into your body instead of just taking whatever you got at the pharmacy and hoping for the best. Which, listen, I will admit I was guilty of doing that for over a decade. But with Ritual, there is no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during their first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash military10. Ladies, if you're sitting there, I want you to stop what you're doing and consider your bra. How comfortable is it? Is it poking and prodding you, but you hardly notice anymore because you got used to wearing a bad bra? Well, stop that. I recently discovered Third Love. Shout out to Third Love for sponsoring this episode and their bras are phenomenal. Every lady has a bra type, push-up, underwire, wire-free, and I'm a wire-free girl. These tatas hate wires, but I'm happy to announce that Third Love's bras don't do that. They have the ever-popular 24-7 t-shirt bra, which you should definitely check out, 
But my all-time favorite Third Love bra is the Form 360 Fit Wireless Bra. Yes, it's truly the perfect bra. The material is super smooth with a smooth band and it forms to your body. It provides a lift without being too exaggerating and it stays put all day. I will admit that I have a hard time finding a bra that fits right, but when I do, I usually buy it in several colors. And that's what I did with the Form 360. My favorite color is the dandelion color. I guess it's because my favorite color is yellow. Shopping online for bras may seem scary, but with Third Love's online fitting room, you will find the perfect fit size in no time. But guess what? If there are any issues whatsoever when you get your bra, simply return it or exchange it using Third Love's free 60-day return policy. 60 days? That's more than most places. So listen up, ditch your bad bras, get a better one that makes you look and feel great. Upgrade your bra today and get 20% off your first order today at thirdlove.com slash military mama. That's military M-A-M-A. All right, 20% off your first order today at thirdlove.com slash military mama. She quickly confesses, it's not your baby, I had an affair. What the what? Steve can't believe his ears. But instead of flying into a fit of rage, which is what Diane expected, he didn't really care that Diane was pregnant with another man's baby. He just cared that she was okay and that the baby was okay. Steve's lack of a reaction didn't really surprise Diane since he had just agreed to give her a divorce. So she's thinking, oh, okay, cool. So this guy is is good with it. She tells him she's fine, that the baby's fine. And Steve is, he's so calm and collected that he actually asks her, I'm going back to the house. Can I get you anything? Because I know you're going to be here for a few days. And Diane says yes, and she makes him a list. And then he leaves around 3 p.m. And I imagine at this point, Diane, she's probably beginning to think, wow, I'm starting a new chapter in my life. My husband is granting me a divorce. I'm having a baby with another man and I'm turning a new leaf. And if she thought this, she wouldn't be wrong. About an hour later, Steve returns to the hospital and this time he's wearing his civilian clothes. This time though, he is not the sweet, concerned husband who left earlier. This time he's pissed off. He's irate. He wants answers. He wants to know who is the father? How could she do this? Did she have sex in his house, on his bed, in his shower? He wants answers. But Diane won't give him anything. Although she does tell him that her and her lover did have sex in their house. They had sex on a blanket on the floor. This information only makes Steve more angry. He's sick to his stomach imagining the love of his life having sex with another man in his house. Who is the father? Who is the father? Who is the father? Diane won't answer that. But then Steve cleverly begins to prod his wife. Oh, is the father a senior official in the military? Because this affair could really affect my career. No, 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 it's not a senior official. Oh, Is it a non-commissioned officer like me? Because that could still have an effect on my career. And Diane assures him, no, it's not a non-commissioned officer. Don't worry. I wouldn't do anything to hurt your career. Oh, so it's a specialist. And Diane finally says yes. Steve burst out of the hospital telling Diane, you know what? There's no point in continuing this conversation. I'm going to go back to the house. I'm going to pack. I can't stay in the house one more day after you betrayed me there. And Diane just cries and cries and cries. Things aren't going as she had planned. But when Steve leaves that hospital room, he doesn't go back to the house. He goes to base and he knows exactly who he's going to be looking for. He begins his hunt. While on base, he's acting completely normal. Steve asks a soldier if he knows where the lover is, and the soldier points to a phone booth across the street. While Steve is looking for Diane's lover, her hospital phone rings. And it's her boyfriend, Specialist Gregory Glover. You see, when Steve was back in the U.S. for his four weeks of training, 
Greg continued his friendship with Diane. And although in the beginning the, the relationship was platonic, one thing led to the next and they became intimate. Diane found out she was pregnant in early October and she and Greg were over the moon excited about this pregnancy and their future. Greg was actually being transferred to North Carolina in mid-December and Diane was eager to return to the U.S. to find a job. They even talked about marriage, but what? They, what? They had a huge problem. She was still married to Steve. But you know, this was soon going to be a non-issue because Steve had finally agreed to grant her a divorce. The relationship between Diane and Greg was so sneaky that remember when she went on her girl's trip to decompress? She actually snuck away for an entire night to spend it with Greg. And remember, Greg even helped to plan the Thanksgiving dinner that year. The Thanksgiving dinner, the one where afterwards Diane tells her husband that she wants a divorce. So Greg receives Diane's message from the messenger around 5.15, and he goes over to the phone booth to call Diane. And when Diane answers, she begins to tell him all about her day. Hey, I wasn't feeling well. I came to the hospital. Oh, and by the way, Steve knows I'm pregnant. But don't worry, he doesn't know who the baby's father is. And even though I wasn't feeling well, the doctors say the baby is going to be fine. And so then Greg begins to share his day. And he admits that earlier that day, he got a ride from Steve. And Steve, while he's giving Greg a ride, he confides in him that he found the wife's diary. So this phone booth conversation, it lasts between five and 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, Greg tells Diane, oh, wait, your husband's here. He's coming towards me. And within seconds, the phone goes silent. Diane has no idea what happened or the horror she would later see. Back at the phone booth, Gregory was engaged in a battle for his life. You see, Steve had showed up, but he was past the point of wanting an explanation. In the phone booth, Steve attacks Greg with an 8-inch double-edged knife, but his initial strikes only create superficial wounds. Greg is able to escape the phone booth death trap, but he freaking slips on the wet cobblestones outside. And then, of course, Steve isn't wasting any time. He gains the superior position and he begins to stab Greg. But Greg is fighting valiantly for his life. I mean, he wants to live. He wants to explain what happened. By this point, the, the two, they're outside the dining facility on base. And Greg's roommate, he hears the scream while he's eating dinner inside. And the, win, the, the roommate comes to the window and he actually sees Greg and another man. At that point, he didn't know who it was. He sees these people, these guys, and they're, they look like they're wrestling. But then Greg stops moving and there's blood everywhere. There's other witnesses yelling, stop, stop, someone call the police. And there's one witness who describes Steve as cutting meat or skinning a deer. And another witness describes Steve's actions as sawing at the victim's head. Then Steve stands up and he begins to kick Greg's head. When all of a sudden, Greg's head detaches from his body and it rolls 10 to 15 feet but Steve is as nonchalant as ever. He walks over to the head. He picks it up by the hair. He looks at it and says, quote, this is what you get for being an adulterer, end quote. And then he tucks the head under his arm like a football and continues to walk off towards his car. And then he has the audacity to smugly say, hmm, and he said he was sorry. The witnesses can't believe their eyes. They had just witnessed one of the most brutal crimes ever. I mean, for those people, at least. And this guy was just walking away with a head and he got into his car. 30 minutes after the call with her lover went silent, Diane is still in the dark about what occurred back on base. When all of a sudden she hears heavy footsteps coming towards her room and she actually recognizes them as her as her husband's. And Steve walks into the room, he puts a bag down, he grabs Greg's head out of the bag, and he shoves it in Diane's face, and then puts it down. He puts the head down on the nightstand next to the bed with Greg facing Diane. And then, as if out of a movie and rehearsed a million times, he says, quote, Look, Diane, Greg's here. He'll sleep with you every night, 
only you won't sleep at night because all you'll see is this, end quote. So, of course, there's a big commotion going on in that room and the doctors are flooding into the room trying to figure out what's going on. One of them leaves to call the police and the other ones, they're just kind of stuck because then Steve says, oh, come on in, have a seat, close the door. I have a story for you. Now, at this point, these doctors must be petrified. They don't know what this madman is up to and they don't know if they're going to be his next victims. But soon, the doctors realize that Steve isn't interested in hurting them. He just wants to tell his story. He just wants to be heard. Steve confides in them that his wife has just humiliated him by having an affair with his friend. And Steve says he's no idiot. Not only did she have an affair with his friend, but she had an affair with other men as well. And Steve also tells them that he learned how to disconnect a head from a body. Clearly. He says, quote, You know, you gave me enough clues. It was easy enough to figure out. I'm not normally a violent man. In fact, this is my only violent act. But don't underestimate me. I'm skilled at what I do. I studied this. I planned this. I calculated this. I did this for you. I love you. End quote. But man, Steve was on a roll. He continued to talk. When Diane asked him about Greg's body and the knife, Steve replied, quote, I'm not that stupid. I don't care if they put me in jail for the rest of my life because I'll just think about you. And I don't care if they put me to sleep, if they kill me, because I'll just think about you while they do it, end quote. One of the doctors at this point, he's getting sick to his stomach. He attempts to cover the head with a blanket or a rag or something. But Steve says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. I want Diane to sit there and see the gruesomeness of her actions. And so I'm thinking like the gruesomeness of her actions. How about the gruesomeness of your actions, dude? Steve was cooperative during the investigation. He even points the police to his car. And the police, they find a backpack with clothes, food, his passport, a copy of that diary entry, and they find a briefcase with personal files. And so just something that I thought was crazy The bag that Steve used to transport Greg's head, I was reading about this, and that bag, on the outside of the bag, it said head. And I was like, wait, what? Why does this bag say head and he's carrying a freaking head in it? And, and of course, I had to, I had to, I had to figure out what was going on. And so my, I went to my best friend Google and I discovered that head is actually an athletic company. It's like Nike or Under Armour. And, you know, you had to have a gym bag that says, you know, Under Armour or Nike or whatever. And so head is basically an athletic company and they specialize in tennis, swimming, skiing and a whole bunch of other things. But, you know, come on, can this story get any more fiction like? Well, you hold your horses, friends, because this story does get crazier. Do you ever get sick of how many times you're scrambling to figure out dinner plans? I mean, dinner is every night. How can someone be so unprepared for a daily task? I'm super guilty of this sometimes. Well, fret no more, because with HelloFresh, you never have to worry about what's for dinner. Because HelloFresh will deliver farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes directly to your doorstep. March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories and with only one third the sodium in other meals. This month, the dietitian win menu includes pecan crusted chicken, one pan spiced turkey lettuce wrap, creamy Dijon dill chicken, and Southwest stuffed green peppers. I recently tried the Southwest stuffed green peppers and they are delicious. And while this meal appeals hardcore and hard to make, the recipe was super easy to follow. It took roughly 30 minutes to make the entire meal, so I call that a win. HelloFresh is truly life-changing. No more worrying about mealtime. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60. That's Military M-A-M-A and the number 60. And use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60 and use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Upon further investigation back at Steve's house, they find some interesting things. Some books about knife and knife fighting. One booklet is titled Everyone's Knife Bible. And then there's a pamphlet titled 
your silent partner, which is knife-oriented. Sadly, at the time of the murder, Steve and Diane were both 26 years old. Greg was only 21. Because the murder took place on the military base, the military had jurisdiction in this case, and therefore, Steve was facing a general court-martial, which is the same thing as a felony-level trial, and he was charged with premeditated murder. The trial took place at the end of March and through early April of 1994. He chose a jury that consisted of four officers and three non-commissioned officers, six men and one woman. So you're probably wondering, this guy must be insane or he must be something because normal people don't do this. But before the trial, they did order a sanity board to ensure that Steve was both sane to stand trial and that he could appreciate the severity of his crime when he was committing it. And part of this evaluation consisted of a total of 15 hours of interviews with Steve by professionals. And the final report indicated that Steve was sane to stand trial. And at trial, Steve's defense team, they're arguing heat of passion. They're arguing this is not premeditated murder. This is someone who had a spontaneous outburst of rage. And you should convict him of voluntary manslaughter, not premeditated murder. But because at this point, of course, the defense can't say he didn't do it. You have dozens of witnesses at the base that are that watched him commit this heinous crime. And then you have all the people at the hospital who he sat here and, and just confessed to. So they couldn't confess that it was someone else or mistaken identity. So they, they were trying basically to get a lesser conviction, voluntary manslaughter over premeditated murder. But the jury, they didn't agree and they convicted Steve of premeditated murder. So I wanted to talk about this briefly. I mean, what do you guys think? Is it premeditated murder or is it heat of passion? For me, when I see this, there there's no way that this is not premeditated. Heat of passion is like you walk in on your spouse in bed with another person and you quickly go to your gun case and you go back and you shoot them up. That's heat of passion because you're just so freaking furious. You don't even have a chance to think. There's like this fog that happens, right? But in the same scenario, if you find your spouse in bed with another person and you go downstairs and you make a sandwich and you watch one episode of the Jerry Springer show and then you get your gun and you come upstairs and you shoot them up, you had plenty of time to change your mind and not commit that murder. So I don't that's not heat of passion. Right. And in this case, I have a hard time believing that that they could have even found him guilty of of heat of passion because at this point he finds out early on in the day probably after three o'clock who his wife's baby daddy was and then he goes and he's he doesn't just go straight to Greg and do this he's looking for him he's like hey have you seen him whatever whatever and, and then even after he commits the freaking heinous crime he has the the mental clarity to take the head with him and then basically confront his wife I mean He's there because he wants vengeance for he feels like he's been humiliated and he wants his wife and he wants Greg. Clearly, he's humiliated him, but he wants his wife to see the humiliation that she caused him and then the humiliation that he then caused on Greg. This trial lasts many weeks. And of course, they bring in every single person, probably. I don't know, but they bring in people who watch the murder take place. They they bring in the doctors from the hospital who who heard his confession. And in addition to people who actually witnessed the crime, who could talk about Steve's state of mind, they also bring in a handful of Steve's co-workers. But these co-workers, they don't have anything, I'm going to say, significant to add about the crime itself. They're just there to talk about how Steve is the sharpest soldier they've ever met and he's the best thing since sliced bread. So they're there to boost Steve's persona as this perfect soldier. The most interesting information that I found in my in my research for this case, and, and this will become more relevant later, uh, relevant or irrelevant, whatever. But I found in my research a sworn witness statement. I didn't actually find the sworn witness statement, but I found an article that talked about the sworn witness statement. And it's from Greg's commander at the time of his death. We're going to call him Lieutenant Colonel N. And Lieutenant Colonel Enns states that he didn't tolerate adultery. He basically is like, I have a zero tolerance policy in my unit against adultery because 
it causes a riff among my my workers and I need them to be sharp. I need them to be focused on work. He's made it clear my zero tolerance policy includes you having serious consequences if I find out that you committed adultery. And so it's unclear to me if Greg was scheduled to be promoted before he died, because sometimes if someone is scheduled to be promoted and then they die, the military will posthumously promote that person after they die. And in this case, I don't know if Greg had a line number or if he was scheduled to be promoted at some point before he died. But Lieutenant Colonel N writes in this letter that he didn't posthumously promote Greg specifically because his affair with Diane was, quote, not consistent with the honor of the U.S. Army, end quote. Keep that in your back pocket. Another piece of testimony that I found compelling was a testimony of Diane's co-worker, you know, the messenger. And he testifies that when he passed along the message to Greg, the veins in Greg's head were pulsing. Greg was shaky and he was very nervous. And this was new information for me because I was thinking Greg got attacked. He had no idea what was there to confront him about. I mean, clearly he knew, but he didn't realize that it was going to turn, you know, that elevated so quickly. And now I realize Greg probably knew he was in a world of hurt. He just didn't realize the extent of Steve's anger or his rage. During the sentencing phase of the trial, the jury finally hears from Steve in the form of an unsworn statement. And this I found to be absolutely fascinating. Steve describes the day of the murder as an out-of-body experience. As he approached Greg in that phone booth, he felt physically incapacitated. He got tunnel vision and he actually didn't even feel like himself, almost like he was watching the entire scene unfold in a movie. And this is the craziest thing I have heard. He actually says that as he's killing Greg, his victim, his victim doesn't feel like Greg anymore. He actually feels Greg's presence disappear. And that was just so, so sad. For whatever reason, the jury in this case, they take mercy on Steve during the sentencing phase. And even though premeditated murder carries a mandatory life sentence, they recommend leniency in his prison sentence. Now, I am about to really nerd out on some military terms for a few minutes, but it's really important for the story, and please bear with me. In the military, general officers, specifically general court-martial convening authorities, are the people that make charging decisions. Am I going to send this case to a court-martial? In the civilian sector, it's usually the district attorney who makes that decision, but in the military, it's a general officer. In addition to the general officer sending a case to court, once the court is is done, once there's a conviction and a sentence, that entire record of trial goes before the general officer. And that general officer reviews the entire record of trial and they sign off on it. In addition to, to signing off on it, the accused member can submit clemency matters, and that's basically asking for mercy, you know, have mercy on me for whatever. I'm the best thing since sliced bread, yada, yada, yada. And that's different from the civilian sector, right? Because once you have a conviction and in the sentence, it's it's very rare, but unless there's a there's a court that overturns your conviction, it's very rare to have someone outside of a court overturn your conviction. But in the military years back, they could do this. So I just wanted you to know this in advance. So in the present case, although the premeditated murder called for a mandatory life sentence, the sentence was not final until that general, you know, the general reviewing the case file, said it was final. In this case, the jurors, they felt so much sympathy for Steve for whatever reason that five of the seven jurors, they recommended clemency in the form of no more than 30 years in jail. One juror recommended no more than 20 years, and it was only the jury president that said, nope, premeditated murder is mandatory life sentence, and that's what I recommend. For reasons that we will never know, the general court-martial convening authority in this case reduced Steve's prison sentence to 45 years. And, And just a note before everybody gets outraged, changes in the law in the recent years have extremely limited a general court martial convening authority's ability to one, set aside a conviction, and then two, reduce sentences in serious crimes. So that has been a pretty good change in the law, and this was very recently in the last decade. A side fact, but something interesting about the jury in this case, and this is important. During the same time frame that Steve Schapp committed his crime, there was another crime that had occurred 
at that same base by another soldier. That soldier pled guilty to unpremeditated murder for the killing of his one-year-old daughter. That case, and, and I, was, I wasn't able to find anything really on that case, but the father, he beat his little girl, and then he threw her out the fourth story window, which is just freaking sad. The jury sentenced that soldier to life in prison, but because he had a plea agreement, the convening authority only sentenced him to 40 years in prison. And here's the kicker, guys. Four of the seven jury members who sat on the baby murder trial, they also sat on Steve's jury. That last bit of information had me wondering, do you think that the facts in that case where the soldier killed his daughter, maybe the facts in that case were so brutal that it just made the facts in this gruesome headless lover triangle case seem less egregious? I, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I, I would love to hear from you because that's really the only explanation that I could have as to why the jury, they just felt so compelled to recommend such leniency in this case. And final note, I did look up Steve to see his whereabouts. And according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons website, he was released on parole in April of 2017 after serving a little over 23 years of his 45 year sentence. He is currently 52 years old. I just want to say this here. I didn't bring this case up to retry Steve in the eyes of the public. I mean, he's already faced his day in court and he's already served his time and he's still serving his time because he's freaking still on parole and he has to live a life on the straight and narrow or he could face going back to jail. And so this is not to to cause outrage about the case. This is just to bring to, to light that these types of cases happen and we really just need to be vigilant, you know? Another note, the GCMCA in Shap's case did not do anything illegal in reducing his life sentence to 45 years. And it is not uncommon for someone to only serve a little bit over half of their sentence before being paroled. The Shap case law is still good law and it focuses on differentiating between heat of passion, voluntary manslaughter, and premeditated murder. I couldn't find conclusive open source information about Diane and her whereabouts. And and even if I did, I'm not gonna put it out there, but if she did go on to have a successful pregnancy and to have the baby, then Greg and Diane's baby is currently 25 or 26 years old. All right, I know true crime enthusiasts love List. You know, I I follow lots of these shows and I, and I read a lot of true crime. And so lists like, you know, how to get help if you're in danger, how to be kind, you know, how to stay safe. Well, I'm going to start a list for us and it's going to be called the True Crime Army Rules or we can call it whatever you guys want. You know, my listeners... You guys run this, so you will tell me what you want to call it. But for now, we'll just call it the True Crime Army Rules. And these rules will, they will apply to various scenarios. This particular rule that I'm going to mention today is a rule to avoid being a subject on this podcast. Okay. So True Crime Army Rule number one is, drum roll please. Divorce is always better than murder. Always. That's it. I don't need to explain this one, but really save yourself the decades in jail and just sign the dang divorce papers. You will find love somewhere else. I mean, people in jail find love. If people in jail find love, you can find love. Seriously, that's it. But let's keep this rule in our back pocket because I have a feeling that this one in particular will come up again and again in future episodes. So that's the story of Steve and Diane and the love triangle that ultimately led to a man losing his head. If you liked my retelling of this true crime, please be sure to give it a five star rating and don't forget to leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And don't forget to tell everyone that you know to listen. Please follow on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast. And if you want to reach out personally, please email me at militarymurderpodcast at gmail.com. This is a one-woman show, guys, created and produced by me, Margot. All of the music was created by Ty Ops. To find the list of all of the sources I pieced together to bring you the story, I encourage you to go to my website, www.militarymurderpodcast.com, to check out the links. If you want to suggest a case, you can do that on the website. The only caveat is that there must be a military connection. You know, it's called military murder, guys. 
Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, Mouth working on our podcast.